side, pick your side kind of thing happening. Yeah, but I mean, even like the, what, the, what the Crystal House story, right, we yeah. covered, it's shocking when a female kills her parents or her father. Right. Right? I mean, maybe that yeah, comes I mean, from I a sexist point of view in, some in society. Like, they don't think the female's capable of that or whatever. But, yeah, I think even to this day that, that um, kind of gives people pause. When they see that, yeah, it does. But I think it's rooted in these very antiquated. Not to say that women aren't capable of killing roles. people. Right. They are totally. They've been doing it for a long time. The case I want to talk about next is the Black Dahlia murder. So a case that fascinates me, the Black Dahlia. And if you want to get further into the story, a little deeper than we go, obviously, check out Hollywood and Crime. I listened to a great. It's like their first season. They have an awesome, like, you know full season that explores all of the Black Dahlia theories. There were multiple like murders in Los Angeles of women during this time that they could either be tied together or maybe there was just like a lot of people murdering women at that time. I don't know. No, but that's, that's fascinating. so interesting. I've listened to it because you told me about it and um, that's very fascinating. Some of the possible connections between multiple victims there. In yeah, it's really, LA. really cool. So we're skipping ahead to the 40s. We were back in the 1890s. Now we're in the 1940s. On a winter morning, or maybe around like 10 a.m. or so, Betty Berzinger went for a walk next to this vacant lot, which was in the southeast, I'm sorry, southwestern part of Los Angeles. She stumbled upon a disturbing scene, as you can imagine, lying next to the sidewalk at West 39th Street and South Norton Avenue an area in Limert Park, known as the Lover's Lane, there was this body of a naked woman, and she was mutilated. Yeah, because and like posed, right? The discovery on January 15th, 1947, led the LAPD to launch the largest manhunt in the city's history. So many man hours put into this case. Especially if you look at it over the course of these, like, decades. Right. The body had been cleanly severed at the waist, drained of blood, bathed, and positioned with the lower half about one foot away from the upper half. The victim's greenish-blue eyes were open, and her hands were positioned by her head with elbows bent. Her legs were wide apart. She had rope burns on her wrists, ankles, and neck, while her arms, left thigh, and right breast all featured deep lacerations. So she was completely severed at the waist? Yeah, and drained wow. of blood. Oh my God, I didn't remember that part. Each corner of her mouth had been cut, creating this chilling impression that she was like smiling. Like a joker smile? It's really garish, yes, like a joker smile. Holy shit. According to a report by the University of Southern California's College of Education, the letters BD had been carved into her thigh. However, this claim is still debated. Okay. On whether that's true or not. Whether or not it was a BD? Right. LAPD homicide detectives, a guy named Fennis Brown and Harry Hansen, arrived. They scoured the scene, but not before the press had already ascended and started taking a bunch of photographs. However, despite this extensive injury, I guess, to this woman's body, the severity of these injuries, her body had been so carefully scrubbed clean that there was little physical evidence that could be found. Well, yeah, and this was a, back in, what, 1940s, right? Yeah, maybe this was like 46. Yeah, so forensic science was non-existent. No, I'm sorry, this was 47. But they still took the time to clean the body and make sure there's no evidence left behind. That's and it pretty wild. took some time to identify her body. They had to use fingerprints to figure out who she was. And now this is a time when they didn't have computers to generate fingerprints and do the key point searches and all that. Right, so people were, were physically... Like literally, physically combing through fingerprint files. And someone was saying, oh, this fingerprint... And matching them up. Fingerprint looks good, com comparable to this other example of a fingerprint. It's like a tedious job. Wow, it sounds like it. They identified her as 22-year-old Elizabeth Short. She was an aspiring actress, from what reports state. 
But the detective surmised that she had been killed elsewhere and had been driven to this vacant lot. She hadn't been killed there. A Dr. Frederick Newbar, who was the chief coroner for L.A. County, ruled that the cause of death was a brain hemorrhage due to a concussion combined with blood loss, and this was coming from those lacerations that she had to her face. I was going to guess when she was uh, cut in two, practically. Well, they think... No, I'm they, just saying. Yeah. Was that post-mortem, they yeah, think? they think that's probably really? after the fact. Wow, that's, that says a lot, I guess. So, here's what they found out about her, you know, last kind of movements and what she had been doing leading up to her murder. Like I said, you've got to listen to that Hollywood and crime, Black you Dahlia, do. because it really goes into great detail about what she had been doing exactly, but we're just going to touch on a little bit of that. Beginning in May of 1946, Short had, for several months, rented a room at a Hollywood home, which was behind a nightclub called the Florentine Garden, and she'd worked there as a waitress. She had made contacts with some movie business people, um, but she wasn't really doing very well as far as trying to land roles. Like, some people talked about how she would try to do screen tests back then. Yeah. And that she, she hailed from, like, the Boston, Massachusetts kind of area, and she had such a heavy accent that when she went in to do screen testing, they were just like, no. She's like, bastard. She had like a really heavy accent. Go to the and yard and park not the car. Work for okay. talkies. Yeah. And even though she was pretty and she had a, a good look, she just wasn't going to work for movies. At some point, she had apparently been promised a role in like a burlesque review at that nightclub where she lived nearby. She shared. News with her mom in a letter, which was dated January 2nd, 1947. It was the last correspondence she would get from her. Oh, she would send it to her mom. So it was like the last correspondence her mom would get from her. Okay. Before she was killed. On Thursday, January the 9th, Short returned from a trip to San Diego with a guy named Robert Manley, who was a married salesman that she'd been dating. And again, if you do a lot of research into Elizabeth Short. She had a ton of boyfriends. She was just doing her, if you will. She had a lot of boyfriends. She was living life. It was, dear, you know, it was like during the <clears throat> um, 40s. The war had been right. in full swing. She's young. There's a lot of soldiers, sailors, airmen about. She's starting like these long distance kinds of relationships, pen pal relationships. Yeah, it doesn't, she's just a girl about town. It doesn't seem that it seems that she was uh, perpetually single for the most part, and she just did whatever she wanted to do, which there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we're not going to dive too much into her background, but just from what I understand, she was kind of a freeloader. She would live someplace for a bit until the rent was due again, and she'd pack up and move, and she was just kind of a liberty gibbet like she was all over the place kind of yeah. flighty she didn't really want to work and hold any kind of steady job but she was also known to have dressed nicely she didn't really have money and she, she would often bum money from people yeah. or she would try to hang out with people that she thought might pick up the tab right but she was also known to um you know be like i said but she was always very concerned well dressed with her look her and, clothes and um yes presented in a certain way which led some to speculate, you know, where did she get these funds for some of these things? Well, there's been a lot of speculation that she perhaps was a sex worker. Oh, yeah. And was making money that way. Hello. I mean, which, hey, let's face it, that's the oldest profession in the book. Hey, I, w- I would swap that debit card. A, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. I know. It's the, uh, what, the oldest form of currency still in use. If I had one, I would <laughs> cash it in. <laughs> This guy, Robert Manley, he was known as Red. He dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel where she was visiting her sister. Short, wearing a black tailored suit, shown matching suede high heels, was seen using the lobby telephone and then leaving the hotel on foot. She headed south on Olive Street and walked about five minutes to the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge where people recall seeing her stop by as if maybe she were looking for someone. Okay. Six days later at dawn on Wednesday the 15th, a black luxury sedan driven by an unidentified driver briefly parked next to the vacant lot, and then by early morning, Elizabeth Short's body was discovered. That's about all 
They know. Could you imagine finding in the state that it was in? No. I think that's why it's some um, such a kind of a I don't know how to say it like a. I think it's just so fucking shocking. Yeah, very shocking, and um, it's like Grizzly? everybody knows about the Black Dahlia murder. The reason it was given such a you know coined phrase, if you will, and I don't know, it was um. It was just the kind of true crime story that was going to make headlines, and especially at this time. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's just, this is a story. Salacious. We say if it, I mean, it bleeds, has all, it leads. It has all the elements. You and this know? is definitely a story. You have this that... young, beautiful woman. No one knows what exactly happened. She was left in, cut in half, essentially, in this very strange pose. I mean, yeah. I mean, my God, wouldn't it be incredible if they finally got an answer to that one? On January 21st, the city editor of the Los Angeles Herald Examiner got a phone call from a man claiming to be Short's killer. The caller congratulated the paper for its work on the case, but suggested that it may have run out of material. They offered assistance. He told the paper that he was going to turn himself in, but he wanted police to keep chasing him. And he was like, hey, you're going to get some souvenirs in the mail. On January 24th, a postal worker came across a manila envelope featuring words and individual letters cut that were pasted from the newspaper. On it was written, Los Angeles Examiner and other L.A. newspapers. Here is the Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. So inside, they had a copy of Short's birth certificate, her social security card, photographs, and an address book embossed with the name Mark Hansen. Three more letters were received from a person who identified themselves as the Black Dahlia Avenger. The first was handwritten in ink on a postcard and was like, here it is, turning in Wednesday, January 29th, had my fun at police, Black Dahlia Avenger. Wow. The second letter, again, had like the cutout letters. So it's in like a comic book or something. <laughs> and it was like, Dahlia killer cracking wants terms. However, a third letter indicated the killer's change of heart. It was cut and pasted from newspaper letters, and it said, have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. Okay. Uh, I did not know that about the letter. Now, early in the investigation, LAPD interviewed more than 150 men as potential suspects. A friend named Ann Toth, who, you know, was a buddy of Elizabeth Schwartz, and I think they'd been roommates for a little bit had told detectives that the guy Mark Hansen had tried to seduce her and she'd rejected him, the Black Dahlia, over the short. So Hansen became a number one suspect. And you may be asking, like, who was this Mark Hansen person? And I'm pretty sure that he owned that nightclub, the Florentine Garden, where she was offered the, like, job as a burlesque dancer or something. He was okay. like, he'd been, like, her landlord and owned that club. All right. Just in case you were curious about that, I probably didn't tell. Police recovered Short's handbag and a shoe from the top of a trash can about two miles from where her body was found. The items had been wiped clean with gasoline, erasing any fingerprints. Mark Hansen identified the person she was belonging to Short, but denied using the address book bearing his name. No charges were ever brought against him, and he was released. Attention then turned to the guy Robert Manley, he was officially named as a suspect, interviewed. He denied knowing Short in the beginning, but then changed his story. He did pass two polygraph tests and was released. For several months, the murder dominated the front pages of newspapers as the media just sensationalized the life and death of Elizabeth Short. And of course, the more information that started coming out about her, her boyfriend, her past, you know, they were kind of painting her as this little spicy thing about town. Poochie mama. Yeah. So people were really interested in that. And because she was always known for wearing black clothing and she would often wear a dahlia flower in her hair that was also dyed black, the hair, not the dahlia, people started referring to her as the black dahlia. And oh. so it became known as the black dahlia murder. The murder investigation slowed until the summer of 1949 when 
36-year-old Louise Springer, a beauty shop worker, was found garroted in the back seat of her husband's car one block from 